if I can just uh, say to all solutions, I wish them a happy independence, 45th independence anniversary. I know these celebrations have begun. Very important time in our calendar um, for us to remember who we are and what we, what our independence is all about. So I'm very happy to see some of the celebrations that are taking place. I have to say that I'm extremely happy to see that the events are taking place in Sioux Frere. I think that uh, the work that's been done in Sioux Frere um, over the last couple of years have prepared it extremely well to facilitate hosting independence. And in particular, I have to say on Sunday, I think it is, I'm looking forward to the track and field event that's going to be taking place. Um, I think that the stadium is unbelievable. I think that people are going to enjoy themselves and I think it's going to be spectacular. The only disappointment, Minister, the member from Grosley, is that it still has not been certified. Um, and if you need any help in getting that certification, um, I'm happy to have that conversation with you to show you how to do it. Sorry? Sorry? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to the day that we can actually come to this house on certain disciplines, certain areas of development. I think foreign affairs, I've said, is one. I definitely think foreign direct investment is another, and tourism very much applies to that. But in order for St. Lucia to succeed globally and for everybody in St. Lucia to benefit from tourism, it is going to require both administrations pushing the needle forward. I think that the, the TSA, the satellite accounting system report that was done in 2016, was very revealing. And it said at that point, and for those who don't know what the TSA is, the satellite accounting system goes beyond arrivals of tourism. And it gets into the indirect impact. So when we see our GDP, and we see that transportation contributes eight or 10% towards our GDP, what percentage of transportation is tourism? So our taxi drivers, the persons who are providing shuttle buses um, for staff, the transportation of goods. So the satellite accounting system actually goes into some of those elements and shows what percentage of their total amount is attributable to tourism. So for instance, the Minister of Tourism, the member from Castry South, gave a number, 130 million, if I'm not mistaken, for services, electricity, water, sewage, I assume, um, and telecommunications. So again, in the GDP numbers, that would be a macro number, but when you break it out, and I've always said, in the area of Lusilek, one third of the consumption of Lusilek's, uh, or production, is consumed by the hotel sector. But almost 55% of what's paid comes from the tourism sector because the productive sector pays a much higher price than households do in electricity. I say that and I make the argument, I think that your presentation would have been even more meaningful that if you recognized what you were building on. And it has been a collective effort over the years to be able to make this thing work. It seems that the highlight of what we're talking about is inclusiveness. Very, very, very important. Very important. And this is again not to tout me, but to hopefully get an appreciation of how long Alan Shasta has been thinking about village tourism. Wasn't something that just inspired me. It goes back to when I was the director of tourism in St. Lucia. And the program that we have of Let's Be the Best. And Let's Be the Best wasn't about just the tourism workers, was recognizing that every single person in St. Lucia plays a role in tourism. Every single person, gas station attendant, 
going to the post office, government services. I mean, in those days, we, we laugh at it now, that persons who are coming here to get married, imagine, it would take almost six days to get all the certificates that you had to get to get married in St. Lucia. And when we made the amendment that allowed persons to pre-apply and therefore only had to reside on the destination for three days before they could get married, what a significant shift that that was. And these persons used to go down to the police headquarters to get fingerprinted. Imagine that experience, right? And we did it all, of, oh, we have to do this thing the right way. People can't just come and get married here. They have to go through a right process. And it was not until we adopted the idea that we were competing against everybody else in the world for honeymoons and for weddings. And realized that other destinations were making it much easier for people to be able to get married. That's all the processes that are so important. I remember getting into a very big discussion with Sir John. May he rest in peace. Over the causeway. I was not a supporter of putting big hotels on the causeway. What I felt was we should have had a road away from the beach and that we should have subdivided it and made it much more accessible for locals to be able to buy into it. Very similar to what we've been talking about at Sandy Beach. And again, when we speak about Sandy Beach, it's not on the beach. It's saying that the concrete road would become a causeway. And we would not allow any development on the beach, but we're gonna subdivide. We're gonna put in the roads, we're gonna put in the water, we're gonna put in the electricities, we're gonna put in smaller lots that will allow locals to be able to have access to this industry because the, the, the lack of equity comes from the high price tag to build a proper hotel room. It's not somebody saying that I don't want locals to be involved. So the question is, how do we as a government lower that bar to make it, using your terminology, making the industry more inclusive? You make it more inclusive because you make it more affordable. And you have a dilemma. Small hotels have a horrible track record in this country. And as a result of that, many banks don't even want to let them money when they do lend them money, it's because they know the person and they use other assets that that person has, but not the hotel asset. And I can go through a litany of solutions who have tried and failed and have gone bankrupt and have lost their assets. What have we learned from all of those things? How do we resolve that problem? And that's why village tourism came into to play not just from a physical infrastructural perspective, but a component that seems to be missing here is the incubator. Is that when persons want to open up a small property that they have to apply to become a member of Village Tourism Incorporated. And Village Tourism Incorporated will hold their hand in getting the incentives. Village Tourism will provide them with the accounting software. Village Tourism will provide them with the marketing platform, the internet platform. Village Tourism will provide them with the training. So if I am part of a Hilton brand as an example, we get access globally to training. Sandals has become an international brand in itself. It is constantly training. A small property of two beds is never going to be able to afford to do that by themselves. So how do we bring those services so we can lift them up? There's no point in saying the standard is up here because we know that that's where it needs to be internationally. They can't do it by themselves. So it's the same way you say, well, the trickle-down theory doesn't work. 100% right, trickle-down theory does not work by itself. But in economies like ours that are not developed, what you need to do is you need to grow the economy to create the opportunity for things to trickle down but at the same time, you have to give a hand to help push up so that people can access what is trickling down too. 
And that is what village tourism was attempting to be able to do. When I left here as a director of tourism, I went to work for a gentleman called Chris Blackwell, who had a company called Island Outpost. And Island Outpost was the first boutique hotel company in the Caribbean. And the first one wor world globally was a guy called Ian Schrager. So Chris and Ian were the two guys that were leading the world in village tourism. And the first place I went to work um, when I joined him was South Beach. Now South Beach was an amazing development, which came about after the depression. And imagine when you go to South Beach today, which is from 1st Street all the way to 16th Street, Collins and the three streets behind it, was all built in almost two and a half years. All the Art Deco style. So they, 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 they had agreed to a design theme, which was Art Deco and all these small properties. Sadly, over the years, it went bad. In fact, South Beach used to be called um, God's Waiting Room, because a lot of the elderly used to go there. And then it became famous for Scarface. But all of a sudden, in the 90s, there was a revival. And what was difficult is that going to Miami in the mid-90s was not a place that people wanted to go to because of the level of crime. And we had to carve out a brand niche for South Beach, which became extremely successful. We had properties in the Bahamas. We had properties in Jamaica. The first property we opened up in Jamaica was a property called Strawberry Hill, which is overlooking Kingston, 3,500 feet up. In fact, it's where Bob Marley went after he got shot. Irish town. No beach. You had to fly into the most dangerous city and then in North America, which was Kingston, and you had to drive over two and a half hours. Jake's and Treasure Beach, which were all these small properties, but had significant brand value. And after I left working for Chris, I went to work for Air Jamaica, and then when I came home to St. Lucia, I had a choice of two places to build a hotel, because I wanted to build a hotel. Yeah, I built a hotel. Much, much, to your, much to your surprise and all these claims of no, of no building a hotel. So, could have built the hotel at Shock on the beach, or I could have built the hotel in Rodney Bay, off of the beach. And the person who came up with Rodney Bay Village was me. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister at the time was the Minister of Tourism. And I remember our first meeting at his office. And when we spoke about bringing tourism to Marsha, and I remember him saying to me, don't talk to me about naked virgin because that's not the tourism I'm talking about. I said, no, that's not. I said, but every day you have tourism in Marsha. He said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. I said, if you go to the hotels back then and found out how many of the workers lived in Marsha, the vast majority did. And what you just described that Sandals did in San Susi is what they should have been doing all the way back in the 90s. Because there's a saying, if your workers are happy, they're going to become better workers. And they have to be happy at home. So help improve the environment around their homes. All of these things were discussed, all of these things were known, and all of these things were very clear objectives from way back then. So don't come and try to pretend that you're producing something that is new, something that's refreshing. All we have not done is that we have not committed ourselves to it and make it happen even faster. Now, Mr. Speaker, even myself, oh, I'll get there. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry, we'll get there. You know, Mr. Speaker, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Ah, uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's, a, there's a, a simple rule in tourism that once you have appreciation for it, it real, really helps you define the urgency <coughs> and the need for um, the cost of doing business. 
The fact is, Mr. Speaker, is that in order to bring tourists to St. Lucia, as shocking as it may sound, is the first thing that you need is a hotel room. If there is no hotel room, if there is no Airbnb, there's no tourists. Doesn't matter how much airlift you put on, doesn't matter how many attractions you put on, the singularly most important thing to start tourism, so don't tell me it's the only important thing, to start tourism, where it starts, the chicken or the egg, is the hotel room. The capacity to bring people is simply measured by the amount of accommodation you have in your country. <coughs> the question is, how much does it cost to build a hotel room? How much does it cost to operate a hotel room? So, 40 cents kilowatt hour for electricity. Over $22 a gallon for water. The airfare to come to St. Lucia is one of the highest. Not our fault. I'm blaming it on anybody. It's just a fact. And the reality, the only way that we can lower the cost of airfare into our country is by bringing more people. You have to have enough capacity where you can get diversity in your airlift, meaning that you have more than one airline coming in, and that you can get more than one flight a day from your key cities. Because when you are restricted, then your airfare goes up. So there is a threshold. We always used to think that that threshold was 5,000 hotel rooms. But that 5,000 only applies to one market. If you're going to be like St. Lucia, diversified in different markets, then it means that you have to have more than 5,000 hotel rooms. And there is a, a need now to move in that direction. But Mr. Speaker, the member speaks of a premise, the premise of this bill. And really what I see this bill as is house tidying up. Taking some existing bills, merging them together, and then putting some spice in it of what a flavor that they wanted to see come out of this bill. But the first premise that the member said was to grow the economy. Well, what I see in this document and what I heard from min the, the, the minister, we're not going to grow. We're not going to grow. Not. The simple thing of, the, of saying that you're only going to give a 50% tax incentive. So, Speaker, you have countries out there that are giving land unlimited times on tax incentives, are providing we, uh, labor cheaper than we are, providing airfare cheaper than we are, providing electricity cheaper than we are. The incentives are reflection on our high cost. Don't go and drink the Kool-Aid of, what's the famous term that they have? Uh, foregone revenue. That's what I said. If you do not have a hotel room, how much money is generated? So if there's no arrivals, there's no money. The moment a person arrives in St. Lucia, we start collecting money, Mr. Speaker. The moment. The first set of money we collect is the $100 at the airport. We're then collecting money from all the jobs on the people in the consumption are working at the airport. We're collecting money from the taxi driver who pays duties for his car and who's paying, well, an extraordinary high amount for, for gas right now. I have no idea what the excise tax is, but I'm sure it's way in excess of $4, given what the world market on, 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 on fuel is right now. All of that is tax revenue that's being generated. When the people arrive at the, air, at the hotel, the security, the check-in, the people who are preparing the room, the food, the farmers who had to sell the food, the transportation to get there, the transportation to bring the staff. It is a gift that keeps giving, but that giving is directly correlated to the number of people are staying in our country, one, two, how long they're staying, and three, how much are they spending? I know that many of us are still novices in tourism when we go around banting about how many arrivals we have. It by itself is a meaningless number. Completely meaningless. Right now in this year, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where the US arrivals and the UK arrivals, which are the number one revenue contributors to the country, are down. 
but the Canadian market and the Caribbean market, which were extremely down, have increased. So it shows that the numbers of arrivals might be up, but the economic impact of tourism has gone down. And if we're not going to be honest with ourselves as to how we're going to measure tourism and how tourism creates an impact in our country, we're going to be in trouble. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Speaker, sand and sea. That has been lost for a long time. That is the 70s and 80s. Many destinations, including commercial ones like the Dominican Republic and even Mexico, have diversified away from sun, sand, and sea. And are creating world-class attractions. Golf, secondary home, horse racing. Absolutely. Polo, a question. It goes around. So the reality is, Mr. Speaker, is sports is one of the elements. But sports by itself, the solution to the of, of all-inclusive? Really? Really? If you don't even understand how all-inclusives came about, why did they come about? Because of value. How are you going to show people that they can come to St. Lucia? And going to an all-inclusive is a waste of time. It's where you have great restaurants and you have great things for them to do. That would be their preference. But you have to be able to sell that product at a competitive price against the all-inclusive. And the greatest competitor, in a good way, but the greatest competitor to all-inclusives today is the biggest all-inclusive, which is the cruise. We've lost out. There's no way that shopping is going to exist at a high head level. Go and check for yourself. And go and see the top brands, Cartier, Rolex, Vachon, Costanti, have all left St. Lucia. And it's going to happen in many other destinations because the shopping is better on the ship. People are feeling more secure about buying it from the ship and on the ship. So it means that the, the urgency that we have to move to diversify and provide products that the ships cannot provide, which is the attractions and the experiences, authentic experiences. We need to beef those things up. And that's what village tourism has always been about. And I would certainly like to see the government not only espouse the word, they use community tourism, but actually put it into practice. It's when you make those investments, that is how you're going to grow. When you can cause more solutions to open up Airbnbs. When you can cause more solutions to get into the small hotels. And the idea is, is that you're never going to be able to not have bigger hotels. Because the bigger hotels, Mr. Speaker, the bigger hotels, Mr. Speaker, are what going to drive the airlift to the destination. Can't replace it because of the density of what they're providing. So everybody needs everybody. This idea that tourism is in competition with, with, with farming, agriculture, nonsense. The more hotel rooms you have, the more bananas and more products you can sell. If you don't have those products to sell, you only have yourself to blame. You have to get to the standard. You have to help the farmers to be able to provide those products on a year-round basis. What are those products? And that's why, Mr. Speaker, that we moved very quickly to develop what's called Brand St. Lucia. What's Brand St. Lucia? Brand St. Lucia is to take into consideration all of the entities in St. Lucia who promote St. Lucia and to make sure they're on the same page. So that's export St. Lucia, bananas, cocoa, rum, just to name a few, CIP. But pretty soon, the way the CIP is going and the reputation it's gaining, it may actually be more of a detriment to us in how it's being marketed. All of these companies and Invest St. Lucia and Slaspa have to work together because they're all spending out money out there selling St. Lucia. We don't have enough critical expenditure to create a brand that's strong enough, each one of those entities. So that's why the logo that everybody is wearing applies to all of those entities and on the packaging of our food products so that we can benefit 
the more tourists we bring into St. Lucia, the greater opportunity there is for our export products. Corona bear has become the number one selling bear in the world and the United States. Why? There's 44 million Americans that visit Mexico a year. Tequila used to be on the lowest level of liquor. Today, it's on one of the highest levels. And you have tequila companies being sold for billions of dollars because of the synergy between tourism and their exports. And that is something that we have to work on very, very deliberately and with earnest. You talk about airlift. I was just reading, um, and I, it really gave me a chuckle, um, that the ministry was celebrating, I guess that's the chairman, celebrating a new connection to France. So I mean, I hurriedly opened up this thing that's fantastic because we're working to try to get it. Guess what it is? You fly to Martinique and you come across on the ferry to, Mar to St. Lucia. So it means you have to leave the airport, go down to get the ferry to come here. And you know, and I know that, I know that the minister obviously has not done any of this. Because if he personally, and I, I encourage him to do that, go on the ferry and see how the passengers are treated here. And I take blame. I physically went down there and tried to get the this, this, this situation resolved and we could not. But maybe, I, maybe you see, there was a part of it I had not figured out that happened later with the minister, right? So all of a sudden, that's a connection. That's what we're going to go out and market. If that is how low your standard is and you believe that you're going to compete on that product, we're in trouble. If you want to compete in Europe, we need many more hotel rooms. We have to have a very proactive Airbnb program and that they can be consolidated into a set of rooms because the tour operators are not going to want to go and, 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 and license each individual one. Somebody is going to have to do that. So there's a lot of work that we have to do because Europe is vertically integrated. The airline is owned by the tour operator who owns the travel agency, who owns the hotel. So until you get one of those hotels in there, like what Jamaica did with the Spanish chains. And even with that, look how long it's taking Jamaica to develop that European market. I want to speak specifically of Soufrer, because the member from Soufrer brought it up. Airbnb in new development. What is going to make Airbnb new development work? It's the new roads and sidewalks that we put in. That is what's going to raise the level and make every part of Sufra accessible to tourism. Because the way it was being done before, it couldn't work. Even the idea of Hummingbird Beach, the members on the opposite side when they were in government between 2011 to 2016, the same Mr. Dalson. I'm sorry, I don't want to mention anybody's name. I apologize. The former representative of Sufra couldn't even get that. The concession stands, not on just on the beach, all the way down. What now the stadium is going to do in terms of sports, what the stadium can do in terms of entertainment. And this weekend is a classic example. And I'm going to say to the minister, the member from South, from, from Soufer South, uh, from Soufer, Fonse Jack. The copper factory is a golden opportunity to create an authentic shopping mall where people can be producing products that are made in solution and can become a very unique experience. It is a huge opportunity and will significantly change the lives of people there. Ancillary Can Reeves, by bringing a hotel there, by fixing up the drain, fixing up sidewalks, repainting the place. Why? You already have hotels in the area. We don't want it to be just a fish fry one night a week. It must be an experience every night. And it's to help improve, not change the ownership, but improve the quality of the restaurants, improve the quality of the experience that people have. The same thing in Groselet. Castries. Castries Market, is, it, it should be the number one attraction in St. Lucia where you can go and experience authentic St. Lucia. The vast majority of products that the vendors are selling are imported. Even down to a t-shirt 
the slogan on the t-shirt is important. And that's what we were trying to change. That's what village tourism is all about. Creating all of the services around to help strengthen the tourism product. When you put musical festivals on and you're bringing international artists and paying them a million US dollars, you're leaving behind your local artists. Denry Segment is a unique sound, a sound that can be developed all over. And when we talk about village tourism, we speak about people like the Lamantines and Fondue, world class, who took our architecture, took our shadow houses and put it on a cocoa plantation, not on a beach. Hummingbird Beach. And, and she suffers because of the noise and what's taken on. But yet she's trying to provide a unique experience. How do we make and create an environment that everybody can coexist and everybody recognizes by Hummingbird being successful, Fondue being successful, and Shasta, everybody being successful, and the Airbnbs being successful, everyone wins. Because the more people that they have, the more opportunity there is to be able to make money. View Fort spoke about Sandy Beach, about putting the infant. The first thing the minister did is he put that aside. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to register in my head that he's coming here, okay, you want to change the name. I get that, that's the typical thing. Community tourism. But even if you believed in community tourism, you will ought to have supported what's taking place in Sandy Beach because that is the greatest opportunity DSH. to allow DSH. said Lucians. Remember DSH? The, the, DSH didn't have it. No better DSH. Not Sandy Beach. Not Sandy Beach. Bring it, no problem, and we'll have the conversation. But that's where you can pick up the phone. And you can say, you can call me and say, uh, you can say, you can say, you can say, you can say that DHH is saying. All right. Sandy Beach was invest in Lucia. It was invest, invest in Lucia. In fact, the billboards were up there as invest in Lucia. Yes, no problem. Bring them. Yes, bring them. Okay? Bring them. You know what, Mr. Mr. Speaker? I'm so tired of members on the opposite side. Right? The member over there wants to make allegations about my wife. I deliberately didn't stand up. If you have any document with my wife's signature on it, bring it to the house. Stop threatening and speaking half-truths. Half-truths. Go and, go and present it. I'll be happy to sit down. Okay? Sandy Beach development. The land that was on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the causeway. Nothing to do with going on the beach. The billboards were up there at both ends, being done by Invest in Lucia. You know because you stopped it. You decided that that wasn't a good idea. So Mr. Speaker, the member now speaks about incentives. So they have repealed the two incentive acts. Nowhere, nowhere in the document other than what he said, indicates what the criteria for incentives are. No. Huh. There's no schedule, no nothing. So you've, you've taken away what existed before that said if you put in 20 rooms, you're going to get X number of tax holiday. Nothing. What it says is, is that there's a committee that's going to be formed that's going to review it and make a recommendation to the minister to be then endorsed by, by, um, by cabinet. And I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. That's not transparency. And it makes it worse yet who the minister is and his tra own track record. That's not something that we should be promoting. How do you take an incentive act that is very deliberate on what you can invest and what you can expect to get and just expect you're gonna put an application in through a hole? You don't even know who it is? And whether you're gonna get, and now he's telling me, because he's telling us for the first time, that the limit is going to be 50%. Good luck with that. St. Lucia is not going to be able to compete. I can tell you right now, that's going to be rejected by the market because you said something that's the most important thing that you've said, but I want you to follow through with it. You said tourism is an export. It's an export. That means that we have to react to what the market says. You have to have an incredibly strong product. Even Dubai, Dubai couldn't go out in the 90s and sell what they had to do. They had to reinvent themselves. 
They had to reinvent themselves. They had to be something to attract people. And they had to create critical mass. We don't have the resources to do that. So exactly what the Prime Minister said previously is we're going to have to depend on PPPs, public sector private partnerships. And here it is, the government was working with DSH and the PPPs, and all the opposition can do was to criticize. And today, today, I hear the Minister of Tourism speak a language I didn't know that he understood, but I'm so happy he does, to understand the importance of Cabot, the import, to understand if he ever gets his act together as to what DSH would bring. But I'm also saddened by some of the transactions that have taken place, Mr. Speaker, GPH being one of them, the Bananas Land being another one of them. But Mr. Speaker, the levy, the levy system is set up. You want to now get hoteliers who have not applied for incentives to pay as part of the incentive. And 99% of those persons are very, very small properties. So I think to go and ask them to be collecting the, the levy, I think is a mistake. We learned it the hard <coughs> way because it was originally included and we had to back out of it and after talking to everyone. But I'm also going to say to you, this idea that you may have of expanding the levy to be attractions, take that out of your head, because you're double taxing. The levy is what a tourist pays every day. Tourist day. He arrives at a hotel, he pays his levy every single day. Who do you think is going on the tour? The same, the same person. The same person is going to go on the attractions. So what, you're going to charge them now the levy twice? That's what you said. You said it's going to be expanded. Not now, but in the future, that's where you're going to go. That everybody's going to pay. Okay, Mr. Speaker. So you're going to get the tourists. The tourists are already paying the airport tax of $100. Sorry? They pay the airport tax. Okay. And they also then pay the levy. They were paying the levy. It used to be called a tax, a tax accommodation tax, which was a percentage. And that's the fundamental change that was made, Minister, in order to make it easier for us to collect the money, as to do it as an absolute amount, than trying to calculate what the hotel is selling their room rate at. It's hard to figure out what that rate is. Hard. So, Mr. Speaker, I find it that there are parts of this that are very good. I, I, I like the idea of consolidating our business. I think that the ideas of some of the committees that have been formed are good ideas, but I think that they are too, too empowered. So Mr. Speaker, a hotel license, we've argued about this forever. And the staff remember the many discussions that we've had about the, the, the license. What is the license? The license is the, the accumulation of all the other licenses. Health and safety, health and safety. The um, fire certification, DCA approval, okay? All these individual licenses make up the hotel license. So what are you gonna do now? You're gonna bring all those services back into the ministry and replicate it? should be the job of the ministry to collect the information and ascertain that those persons do have the certification in all those particular areas. Oh, that's not what it says. It's not what it says. Thank you. So Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the policy group, and it's very important, and I'm glad that the minister recognized the importance of bringing all the players to the table. If we are going to make tourism successful in this country, we have to stop thinking that it's the hotelier that's the main player. The hotelier only makes up part of the overall product, only part. The Ministry of Agriculture plays a part. The Ministry of Labor plays a part. The Ministry of Health plays a part. The Ministry of National Security plays, plays a part. Ministry of Agriculture and Manufacturing Services. Every single one of those entities is tourism. The problem that we've had is we don't talk at the same time on the same subject. 
And that's why marketing was separated. I mean, the idea of developing niche markets, that's, that should be coming market-driven. And once it comes from the market, then now it's how you're going to implement it. But the thing that's going to come the other way around, you're going to force a niche onto the market, doesn't work. And so as a destination, we still have a lot of work to do. I still go around too often and hear people, as I said, speak about numbers of arrivals. That's not taking a jab at anybody. That's both administrations. That's not a real number. When you sit down with the banks and try to figure out from the banks, why is it they don't want to lend more money to the sector? Those are the things, the hurdles we have to overcome. We have to deal with the cost of doing business in St. Lucia and understand what the market wants. If you want to get rid of all inclusives, then it means that your environment, particularly yours, Grosley and Rodney Bay, have to be stand out. That when people come to a Sandals and they go outside to a restaurant, they go in an attraction, they go, you know what, the next time I come here, I could see myself staying here. But when the place looks dirty, it looks shattered, it looks diminished, and we don't have a brand. Everything that we do in this country has to fulfill that brand. And we must ask ourselves, does our environment meet that brand promise? So Mr. Speaker, in wrapping up, I think that this is a good initial try. Like my colleague, I believe there's a lot of work to be done. When we talk about the Tourism Certificate Committee, he has the Permanent Secretary, a representative of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, a representative of the Bureau of Standards, representative of the St. Lucia Hospitality and Tourism Association, a representative of the Ministry of, of Responsible for Health. What happened to the police? What happened to DCA? What happened to fire? Those are the persons that are heavily involved in the certification. And what's good about bringing members from our civil service into that environment is they start learning the jargon. They, are, they start learning the literacy of tourism. Because I've been to too many meetings with civil servants, particularly Inland Revenue. They don't understand the jargon. They don't understand how the industry makes. They're just focused on collecting X number of dollars and not knowing how it was. I remember they used to calculate the uh, occupancy tax because they used sandals as a model. So they knew how much they collected from sandals. So they divided by two to come up as to what the estimation is. Not realizing Windjammer Landing has seven, eight people in, a, in one room, in a villa. Six. And they are, uh, sorry? Seven to eight. Yeah, in, in a three bedroom villa. But that was just one occupancy tax as one room. So the per head was much less. And so that's why the numbers were constantly off. I want to say, Mr. Speaker, I want to see this industry succeed. I really don't care who's getting the credit for it. I'm really hoping that we can sit down collectively together and make sure we're not making the same mistakes over and over and over again. I believe in village tourism. I backed it up by putting my own resources into it and building Coco Palm. And I've spent 20 years trying to help develop um, village tourism in Rodney Bay. I mean, the member from Mikus of uh, Viewfort South, that was where we, 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 we disagreed. I tried to get it so that the occupancy tax that Coco Palm was spending could go into a fund managed by the, the businesses and the residents so that there was money to fix up the sidewalks and fix up the lights. But that never happened. But we need to be able, we need to be able to galvanize all of those things. Don't worry, the, 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 mem the member from Gastries North has learned nothing about tourism. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and in fact, in fact if, if there's one job I think he would do worse than what he's doing with, that, with the roads is in tourism. <laughs> so Mr. Speaker, I just want to leave. I want to leave Mr. Speaker by first of all, again, um, expressing my, my prayers and support to the member from Babano. I really hope that she has a speedily recovery. Um, and again, I want to wish 
all solutions and my constituents a happy and safe independence. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the, the, the maturity of this bill over time. But I think that the, the minister will get pushback from the industry. Um, and he will certainly get pushback from new investment that wants to come into, into the country. And uh, I look forward to hopefully being able to be in the House when we bring those amendments to the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.